Well, howdy everyone, my name's Chris and today I've got, oh, hold on a minute, um, that's better. Today it's my pleasure to present to you the Sigma 200 uh, to 400 well, I am going to have to test this lens outside because if I damage my table with this absolute monster, then my wife won't be too happy with me. Here we have the incredible Sigma 200 to 500 millimeter F2.8 EX DG. Here it is at last, one of the largest and heaviest camera lenses ever made. And my poor video tripod is really groaning under the weight of its 16 kilograms, which is about 35 pounds. So it's not the kind of thing that you'd you'd casually purchase for a bit of a bit of walk around street photography or lug up and down mountains for landscape work. In fact, this thing has picked up a number of nicknames such as the Sig Monster and the Green Giant. It's not very often you see a camouflage green camera lens, although I do absolutely love its color. It has been my dream to test this particular lens for a very long time and there are very few reviews of it available on the internet so, so my curiosity has really been piqued. So I'd really like to thank Sigma UK for loaning this to me for a couple of weeks for testing, very kind of them, although as usual this is a totally independent review. It came back all the way, came out all the way back in 2008, so it is quite an old lens now. It predates today's very high resolution digital cameras. It was available for Canon, Nikon and Sigma SLR cameras and its original price was a huge 25,000 US dollars, although you now can find it available for much, much less. If after watching this video, you decide that this is the kind of thing you can handle and you want one, then you should look to get one quickly as this lens is now officially discontinued. And I'm told that only about 200 of them were ever made. Although you can still find one or two new copies of them in the hands of retailers. Let's take a look and uh, see what this, this monstrous and unique piece of equipment can do. The lens's zoom range of 200 to 500 mm is long telephoto all the way, giving you fantastic reach into the distance. Nowadays, there are plenty of other lenses on the market that can give you this kind of reach, but none offer such a bright maximum aperture as f2.8, and as far as I know, there is no other f2.8 lens which goes further than 400 mm at all. That means you can have access to some incredibly out of focus backgrounds in your images, as well as fast shutter speeds for wildlife photography and sports photography. The lens also comes with a 2x extender, which leaves you with a 400 to 1000 mm lens with a maximum aperture of f5.6, which is again uniquely bright for a 1000 mm lens. Now, when it comes to build quality, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this thing was cast out of iron as it really is the toughest, heaviest and most metallic slab of camera lens you could possibly imagine. This thing will still be around long after the apes have taken over the planet, it'll be one of the last remaining remnants of mankind. In its military green colour, it could quite easily be mistaken for an anti-tank rocket launcher of some kind, and there are some hilarious fake reviews on Amazon where supposed owners of the lens pretend to have had run-ins with the police while using it on the streets. It certainly looks like it could shoot down a zeppelin or two. It comes in this enormous Pelican 1780 case, which was originally intended for transporting assault rifles. The case itself weighs 24 kilograms, so it's even heavier than the lens. It's based on a metal lens mount, unsurprisingly, with a weather sealing gasket, and the same goes for the 2 times teleconverter. At the bottom you can see the tripod fixture, on this copy of the lens it would only accept the larger 3 8 inch screws, and I used two of them to make sure my tripod plate was bolted in extra secure. You will need a very very strong tripod to mount this lens with a very good quality head on top of it, even my strong carbon fibre video tripod was really bulking under the weight of this thing, and it was difficult to pan and tilt the lens. To help you though, the lens does have two holes in its handle to help you align it onto your target. 
For any of you lucky enough to get a chance to use this lens, there are some clear safety tips you will need to remember. The instruction manual recommends that you have at least two people to mount it on and off a tripod, although with great care you can do it alone. Obviously, you can totally forget about handheld shooting with this lens. Another safety tip is that you have to be very careful when shooting on a sunny day with this lens. Because of those gigantic glass elements, you will definitely want to avoid pointing this thing at the sun without a very strong ND filter slotted in, ideally about 16 stops. Otherwise, you could damage your camera's sensor, and if you're looking through the viewfinder of an SLR camera, then you could potentially blind yourself, or at least set fire to whatever's behind your viewfinder. Also, if you're shooting with a camera that closes its shutter when it's turned off, like a Canon EOS R5, then you will absolutely want to turn that feature off in the menu system, otherwise the sun could melt a hole through that shutter mechanism very quickly, and you may get laughed at when you take it to Canon Professional Services for repair. The lens's zoom and focus mechanisms are electronic and powered by a separate battery. That is certainly a first for me. Here is the zoom motor in action. You can see the LED panel telling you the approximate focal length, and you can hear the motor working from, well, from quite some distance away actually, and it doesn't work quickly either. At the front of the lens, it is fascinating to watch the glass robotically moving forward and backward along industrial steel beams. The glass elements inside the lens that it has to move around are gigantic and very heavy, I reckon this copy of the lens might have seen a lot of use over the years though, a newer copy of the lens might be a little quieter. Here you can see the zoom in action, and you can also observe here that the lens is not parfocal, you will have to refocus as you zoom in and out. The focus mechanism works similarly, although with a little less noise. In this slightly shaky footage, you can see that the lens exhibits very little focus breathing. It keeps its 500mm focal length whether you're focused closely or far away. The autofocus motor worked fine when I adapted the lens onto my Canon EOS R5, although it works a little slowly, you can see it speeding up and slowing down again, moving all that heavy glass around. I also tested it on a Sony a7R 3 camera with Sigma's official MC11 adapter, but unfortunately that would not autofocus at all. The lens has a twisting mount which allows you to shoot in portrait mode or simply adjust your horizons, very useful. It also has a slot for 72mm filters which is geared up so you can turn your polarizing filters. The front of the lens has a rubber gasket for protection from bumps and a built-in hood, but there's no lens cap available at all, so do be careful how you carry this thing around. Overall, when it comes to build quality, the experience of handling this lens is completely crazy, as you might have expected, but it wouldn't really be fair for me to criticise it for that, because this just isn't meant to be an everyday lens for casual photography, it's a limited edition object for special uses. It truly is an incredible and unusual thing to behold, even if its zoom and focus motors sound a bit like an asthmatic dinosaur during the mating season. Well, let's take a look at image quality. This is quite an old lens now, but I'm still going to challenge it by mounting it onto my 45 megapixel Canon EOS R5. In-camera corrections are not available with this lens, and I will start by shooting without the teleconverter. At 200mm and f2.8, the image is a little soft in the middle with low contrast and some purple fringing on contrasting edges. Interestingly, the corner image quality is noticeably sharper, with surprisingly little chromatic aberration, although we are seeing some darkness from vignetting. The corners are the same at f4, although back in the middle, contrast and overall image quality has greatly improved. Stop down to f5.6 and image quality in the middle becomes excellent. It stays this sharp as you stop down to f11 from the middle and into the corners. Let's zoom in halfway now to 350mm. At f2.8, image quality is a little worse than before in the middle, looking noticeably soft. The corners look a bit soft too, although again, contrast is slightly better there. 
Stop down to f4 and those corners look a little sharper. The middle is still slightly soft although sharper than before and with much better contrast. f5.6 looks better and f8 looks sharp from the middle and into the corners. Finally, let's zoom all the way into 500mm. At f2.8, image quality in the middle is really quite soft here, although still just about usable. The corners look about the same. At f4 though, there's a big improvement in those corners, albeit with some visible chromatic aberration, and the middle of the image looks much better too. f5.6 looks sharp in the middle, and reasonably good in the corners, although that colour fringing isn't going anywhere. f8 and f11 look about the same. So, without using the teleconverter, the lens was definitely softer at f2.8 than I was hoping to see, but it is worth remembering that this is a fairly typical performance for a super telephoto lens of its time. Things have just moved on a bit since 2008. Well, let's put the teleconverter on and zoom the lens in to 1000mm. 2 times teleconverters are notorious for mangling the image quality of even the sharpest camera lenses, so you won't be surprised to see that the image quality at f5.6 is essentially unusable from the middle and into the corners. Those corners look the same at f8, but the middle looks better. You'll need to stop down to f11 for usable image quality, although the picture is still quite soft and over in the corners that chromatic aberration has returned. So, if you're using a teleconverter, you'll definitely want to stop this lens down. At f11, it will be sharp enough for full HD video and for still pictures if you add some contrast and sharpening. Let's take a look at vignetting and distortion now. At 200mm, we see some gentle pincushion distortion and some light vignetting at f2.8. Stop down to f4 or f5.6 and those corners get brighter. Zoom into 500mm and the situation is exactly the same, although the vignetting is just a little bit darker. If you put on the teleconverters, then that distortion straightens out a little, and we still see some noticeable vignetting at f5.6. Stop down to f8 and those corners brighten up considerably. Let's see about close-up image quality now. The minimum focus distance of the lens at 500mm is about 5 meters so it is definitely not a macro lens. At f2.8, close-up image quality is about the same as at normal distances. f4 is a bit sharper, f5.6, very good. Now let's see how the lens performs against bright lights. As an older telephoto zoom lens with the largest glass elements I have ever seen, I was expecting this to be a disaster, but actually the lens performs well here, although as you zoom in, flaring does become a little more apparent. If you are someone who's interested in sun stars, then on this lens you will have to stop down to about f11 or so for them to really appear. Stop down to f22 and they look spectacular. Let's see about the quality of this lens's bokeh. It can easily get you out of focus backgrounds with a unique depth, and generally those backgrounds do look lovely and smooth, although difficult backgrounds can get a bit edgy and related to bokeh is longitudinal chromatic aberration. Here you can see that there's almost none of it at f2.8, at f4 and f5.6, any colour highlighting that was there is now gone. Overall, it was a huge pleasure to finally have the chance to test this incredible lens, not to mention a mighty challenge too. Even though it's a very old model, it's still a real symbol of Sigma's formidably ambitious designs. As I've mentioned already, it is not a lens for normal photographic scenarios, so it just wouldn't be fair for me to judge it as such. It was clearly originally intended for unusual uses such as surveillance or military work or perhaps scientific work, although in fairness it could also be used for wildlife and sports photography if you're happy to carry it around with a big tripod and set it up firmly in one location. As I've mentioned, it is quite an old lens now, and its image sharpness isn't quite up to modern standards, but its image quality overall is still perfectly useful. As I've mentioned, it is a challenging lens in use, and just to carry around with you, but from the right position, and with an excellent quality tripod, it will be able to get you pictures like no other. <laughs>